This is The Last Ship Podcast, Season 3, Episode 8. Thanks for joining me for the unofficial fan podcast for the TNT drama The Last Ship. I'm Al Holtz, and this is the podcast on which I discuss, analyze, and critique the show that carpet-bombed an entire village but didn't harm Chandler's watch. As always, I'll begin with my general impression of the episode, followed by detailed analysis of Season 3, Episode 8, titled Sea Change. I'll name the well-said moment of this week's episode, and I'll wrap up with the naval feature, Ship of the Week. So let's dive in. My general impression of this episode, another excellent outing. This episode was light on action, but heavy on story. We met the new president. We got a resolution to the wolf-tiger saga that started earlier this year and learned that neckties are an even worse idea than we previously thought. And we had the chance to grow our hatred for the regional leaders. But the big reveal here was the reason the cure is not working and the confirmation that so far Dr. Scott was correct in saying the virus could not mutate. And as if all of these revelations weren't enough, we got word that the last ship will be back next summer for season four. Congrats to all involved. The episode opens at President Michener's funeral as a line of mourners pay their respects in the rain. Barnes is there issuing a report and discussing Michener's suicide. In the Situation Room, Kara is removing the POW photos from the board as Shaw tells Rivera that Vice President Oliver is receiving the oath of office on board his plane to St. Louis. Shaw asks Kara to gather all of the info on Asia for the new president. Whatever you think of the media today, I don't believe the reporter that committed the final act resulting in the suicide of the sitting president would be reporting from his funeral. I, I'm That just doesn't seem to sit right with me. However, Maybe in the post-virus world, reporters are few and far between, and he's the only one available. On the deck of the James, Diaz lowers the American flag to half-mast as the crew salutes. In the captain's quarters, Slattery, Chandler, and Sasha are watching President Peng issue a statement of condolence on TV. Chandler gets furious and suggests they take out Peng's mansion with tomahawks. Slattery and Sasha talk some sense into him, and Chandler leaves the room. Slattery tells Sasha that Chandler blames himself for pushing Michener too fast. In the White House, Shaw and Kara are watching another Barnes report, and we learn that new President Oliver was formerly the mayor of St. Louis. Shaw tells Kara that Michener tried to commit suicide previously on the James. Kara, shocked, says she did not know. Shaw tells Kara that it's not her fault. Shaw says, I should not have left him alone and Kara surmises that Shaw and Michener were a couple. There's an entire episode of backstory here that we will obviously never get, such as, how was Oliver selected to be the vice president? Did Michener just grab someone locally available in St. Louis? Or how did that all occur? And then also, how involved was the romance between Michener and Shaw? And how did that all come to be? How did it start? All of that, I'm sure we'll never see any of that, but there's a ton of backstory there that would be very interesting. On the James, Doc Rios and some of the crew, including Wolf and Carlton Burke, are going through boxes of Dr. Scott's supplies, working to reestablish the lab. In medical, Danny arrives to visit Kyoko, who is with the baby, and Sasha. Sasha tells Danny Kyoko has something to say to him, and Sasha will translate. Kyoko tells Green he saved her life, and that she will pray for him every day. Kyoko then gets up and hands Danny the baby, and after a few moments tells him he is a natural. And now, maybe it's the dad in me, but this scene hit me as so emotional, knowing that Danny likely wants nothing more than to see Frankie, and getting to hold that baby boy, and being told that he's a natural. It's just a great scene. At the White House, President Oliver arrives and enters. Oliver comments on how they have lost a friend and that he looks forward to working together with them. He says he first needs to speak to Captain Chandler. Chandler, in comms on the James, receives Oliver's call. Oliver offers condolences and says he hopes he can earn Chandler's trust and confidence. Chandler advises Oliver they are headed to Shanzai and tells him he intends to complete the mission with his permission. Oliver gives his permission. 
Green has Vulture Team prep to go ashore in Shanzai as Jesse surveys the area from the Hilo. Chandler tells Slattery that the president wants proof of life video from the freed POWs for PR back home. Jesse reports that the entirety of Shanzai is burning. In the briefing room, Slattery and Sasha listen as Chandler tells Takahaya that Shanzai has been leveled and Chandler asks if Wu Ming would have had a backup outside of Shanzai. Takahaya responds with the Chinese proverb that means, when children travel far from home, mothers never stop worrying. Takahaya says the family could have carried on the business even after Wu Ming's death, and he tells them where to find the family. Now, if Peng wanted Wu Ming out of the way, why wait until the James is headed back to Shanzai to find him? Is someone in the White House passing information to Peng? The timing of this carpet bombing of Shanzai and the fact that the MSS show up later at Wu Ming's family's compound make it seem obvious that Peng is getting information on the James mission from someone, and it seems that would have to be coming from the White House. In the White House, Kara advises the staff on the new plan and gets Oliver's okay. Oliver then asks about the proof of life videos and Kara tells him they are having a technical issue with the video signal. He tells her to get it fixed ASAP. On the James, Jeter is recording Miller and Diaz for the PR videos. Granderson is in comms working over the radio with Kara and trying to send the videos. Kara is seeing the same interference that has been affecting transmissions previously. Granderson asks how Kara is doing, and Kara tells her she is the one that found Michener. And this is the first time this season that I wished Kara was back on the ship, as I think there could be some excellent scenes between Kara and Alicia as there were earlier in the series. On the bridge, Garnett reports that Vulture Team is less than five minutes from Wu Ming's family's location. We see Vulture Team moving in the darkness, and they come upon some MSS vehicles. As they reach the structure, they observe several women being held at gunpoint and Wu Ming tied to a chair being beaten. Burke and Chandler take out the two outside agents and Wolf moves inside. Then on Chandler's three count, they all take out one of the agents and all of the vulture team moves in. As Wolf runs in, Tiger knocks the gun out of his hand and an extremely intense round of hand-to-hand combat ensues in which Wolf's head is smashed through a wall. Ultimately, Wolf chokes Tiger to death with his own necktie. Just another great display of martial arts from these two actors. Excellent work by both of them. Really, really intense. Just loved it. Wolf and Green search the room and find a number of lottery tickets hanging from the wall. Wu Ming, bloody and choking, offers Chandler his watch, and Chandler takes it. Chandler proceeds to attempt to get information out of Wu Ming using Sasha as an interpreter, and Wu Ming refuses to answer. Chandler nods, and Burke cocks his sidearm and holds it to Wu Ming's head. Just then, one of the women begins pleading in Chinese. Green realizes that the lottery tickets actually contain hull numbers, and Sasha says they also show coordinates. They realize this is the intel that Wu Ming is selling, and they gather up all the lottery tickets. As they do, Wolf finds one with the black circle on the back. At the White House, the regional leaders are gathered in the president's office, and Oliver comments that Senator Beatty was absent from the funeral. Wilson tells him there was an attack on a ration card facility, and he couldn't get away. Oliver suggests maybe Beatty is sending a signal. The leaders tell Oliver that he needs to roll back some of Michener's policies and Rivera tells him the ration card program is the chief cause of unrest. As they continue on, Kara can't take it any longer, and she goes off, defending Michener's policies. Rivera interrupts her and tells her, if we need your advice on the military, we'll ask you for it. Shaw then tells the president that Michener's policies are doing more harm than good. I realize it's only been a few minutes total with them, but I'm entirely fed up with these regional leaders. Something bad is coming related to them, I believe, whether it's this season or next, and hopefully it involves one or more of these whining crybabies being removed from their position. I just, I, they just rub me the wrong way. Also, what is Shaw's game here now siding with Rivera and the regional leaders against what Michener was trying to do when previously she was siding with Michener? I'm struggling to figure that out as well. After the meeting, Kara and Shaw enter Shaw's office, and Kara asks why she did not fight for the policies she helped write. 
Shaw says, if Michener couldn't make them work, Oliver certainly can't. Kara comments that the regional leaders now have control of their local militia and that Captain Chandler would never have allowed that. Shaw says Chandler is 12,000 miles away and the regional leaders need to be able to control their regions. And I believe this little bit here about the regions controlling their own militia is going to play a significant role in a future episode. On the James, Chandler pays a visit to Rios in the newly forming lab. Rios shows Chandler some images from the microscope and tells him the cure in Takahaya and Kyoko's blood is identical to that in the crew's blood. He then shows an image of the virus from Dr. Scott's files and an image of the virus from Kyoko's blood, which is bulkier than that from the files. Rios says he does not know if it's a mutation, but the bulkiness is preventing the cure from working. He tells Chandler he will keep working on it. It's almost humorous to see this sparse, rudimentary lab that Rios has cobbled together, thinking about it in comparison to what Dr. Scott had set up in the exact same space previously. I mean, the, the, there's no comparison between the two. On the bridge, Gator advises Slattery on their position. Jesse has Green, Burke, and Sasha up in the helo, searching for vessels marked with a black circle, and they find one, a pleasure cruiser with the correct hull number from a lottery ticket. Chandler radios the cruiser requesting to board for inspection, and the captain of the cruiser turns up his music and increases his speed. After the James also increases speed, he adjusts course and increases speed again. Slattery orders warning shots to be fired. The cruiser then heads for an atoll, and Garnett gives the helo the order to board the cruiser. As the helo circles the vessel, her captain pulls out a rifle, and Green advises him not to do it. The man surrenders. They search the entire ship, but find only a few M16s. Danny tells the man they can arrest him for illegal possession of weapons and confiscate his vessel. The man then moves to the bar and pulls the beer tap, which opens a compartment containing drugs. He then tells them MSS loaded him up. Sasha moves to the compartment, says Peng doesn't mess with drugs, and pulls all the drug bags out. She then slices open the back of the compartment to reveal a missile. And my question here is, why would you enable opening the secret compartment by pulling the beer tap sideways? For that brief moment, I thought I was watching an episode of the 1960s Batman TV show where they flip the head to reveal the, the bat poles. Surely someone would accidentally pull that tap to the side the wrong way while they're having a party or something and reveal the drugs at the wrong time. It's kind of a cool, like, you know, James Bond sort of thought, but no, th there's no way that would be the case. However, great idea here to disguise the true cargo with a bunch of drugs that the captain of the cruiser certainly would not want anyone to find, so he would protect it. And then, of course, behind the drugs is, is actually the real cargo. On the James, two crew members are working on dismantling the missile as Chandler, Sasha, and Slattery discuss possible uses for it. Jesse arrives and tells them this missile is the same as those she saw on the night her brother was killed. Just then, one of the missile's bomblets explodes, releasing a green powder. Did you have flashbacks here to the Nicolas Cage movie The Rock? That, that's exactly what I thought when I saw this. The nerve agent in that movie was contained in small bomblets very similar to those shown here in uh, this scene. In Peng's office, Peng is chewing out one of his military officers for not killing Wu Ming. He tells the officers it's time to accelerate the mission and orders him to execute the Korean operation and to find the Nathan James. Now, what could the Korean operation be? I doubt it's as simple as launching the green powder missiles on Korea. That seems way too easy, and I can't wait to find out what uh, that's referring to. On the James, Rios explains to Chandler, Slattery, Sasha, and Takahaya that the green powder contains a lectin that binds to the proteins in the virus, shielding it from the cure. He states that people that receive the cure prior to being ex exposed to the green powder are safe. Takahaya asks to see his wife and son, and the guard takes him out. This seems like an extremely sophisticated alteration to the virus and would take someone with extensive skill in this area to accomplish that. So who could that be? We know Niels is dead. It's certainly not Dr. Scott. So who's messing with the virus in this skilled manner to prevent the cure from working? In the White House, Oliver heads into his office with Shaw and Rivera. 
Rivera stops Kara at the door and tells her the president wants to keep the briefings to senior advisors and closes the door in her face. In quarters, Slattery explains to Chandler and Sasha that everyone came out of hiding in Vietnam to get the cure, and if they were exposed to the green powder, they are instead spreading the virus. Chandler says, now we know what Peng's plan is. It's genocide. For this week's well-said moment, I picked a line that should be fairly obvious to anyone in the military, but clearly had to be stated here. Early in the episode, when Chandler is suggesting launching a tomahawk at Peng's mansion, Sasha tells him, you can't just assassinate a foreign leader without consulting with the commander-in-chief. Ship of the Week USS Utah, BB-31, a Florida-class battleship, was built by the New York Shipbuilding Corporation, laid down in March 1909, and completed in August 1911. In April 1914, during the Mexican Revolution, Utah was one of two ships that delivered over 1,000 Marines and Blue Jackets to occupy the city of Veracruz. During World War I, Utah was assigned as a training ship and stationed in Chesapeake Bay. Subsequent to that assignment, Utah departed for Ireland and was assigned as the flagship of Battleship Division 6, which was covering convoys against attacks from German vessels. In December 1941, Utah, now designated as AG-16, was again serving as a training ship and was in port at Pearl Harbor. During the Japanese attack, Utah was struck by two torpedoes and sank, killing 64 crew members. The wreck is still in the harbor, commemorated by memorial, and the ship's bell is on display at the University of Utah. And that will do it for this week. For all things related to the podcast, including subscription links and previous episodes, visit the show notes at thelastshippodcast.com slash s3e8. Our feedback question this week is, will Rios find a way to counteract the effects of the green powder? Clearly, they're going to stop the missiles at some point, but the people who have already been affected with the green powder, will he find a way to counteract that? Leave us your answer to that question in the comments in the show notes. To see episode 8 again, visit TNTdrama.com, find it on your cable system's on-demand feature, or download the Watch TNT app. And join me here again in two weeks. That's right, two weeks. There's no new episode this week. And until then, thanks for listening.